speaker this morning, or the second speaker this morning, holds a Bachelor in Biology from Southeast Missouri State and a Master's Degree in Biology from the Catholic University of America. Uh, she has taught science in a variety of settings from middle school to college since 2008. Prior to working as a teacher, Pamela was involved in biological research as a whole genome library maker at the Genome Sequencing Center at Washington University in St. Louis. She also conducted research in vaccine delivery using T4 bacteriophage nanoparticles and was briefly involved in researching novel gene regulation mechanisms. She has given talks at numerous parishes and conferences, including, I believe, with the National Association of Cat. Also authored two books uh, for the Colby Center, Vaccination, a Catholic Perspective, and another book, Bio Biology, a Traditional Catholic Perspective, which is an easy application of the wisdom of St. Thomas Aquinas and to the science of biology. So without further delay, please welcome Pamela Acker. Thank you. Um, Mike introduced me better than I could introduce myself, so I appreciate that. Um, as, as you heard, I have sort of a long list of credentials working directly in molecular biology. And that has kind of um, led me to the position that I'm sitting in today because I started to doubt evolution when I was a theistic evolutionist in um, graduate school. And I was studying the incredibly intense um, interdependence between genetics and um, everything that goes on in your body, so between the DNA and the proteins. And I'm going to give basically an entire presentation on that in the, the second presentation I'll do after lunch. So I, w I was coming to this um, uh, thinking, oh, well, of course, it's impossible molecularly, um, but I believed that the evidence at the time was so strong that you had to, you had to sort of adopt some sort of theistic evolution perspective. And then I went to a Colby Center seminar, much like you're sitting in now. And the amount of evidence that was presented that was actually contradictory to the entire Darwinian paradigm was overwhelming. So I'm going to present a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the things that I know to you today in this presentation. And in the third presentation I'll give this afternoon. Um, and I call them generally the, the icons of evolution. Because when you're looking at um, when you're looking at people presenting Darwinian evolution, they're often speaking through images. They're using images. We see this in the popular, um, uh, even movies like uh, the Minion movie, which I don't recommend, begins with an evolutionary sequence of the evolution of minions. So kids are exposed, but they're very little. So we're going to look at some of these images that are used to present evolution as true, and then we're going to look, uh, as it were, behind the curtain at the actual scientific evidence for or against specific examples of evolution. So we're going to start with um, one of the most, well, actually we're going to start with explaining what an icon is. Um, so I'm borrowing this wholesale from the sermon of a very good priest who you can find on YouTube if you search on uh, Steve's channel, Census Fidelium, for the icons of evolution. And Mr. Owen spoke a little bit about iconography last night, so I'm not going to, to go over all of his, his good definitions of the teaching authority of these images that are approved by the church. But when you look at this image, it says something to you. It says something of a tremendous importance, and it forms you. As modern people, we tend to lose, have lost the idea that we are actually formed by that which we take into ourselves. We tend to have this idea that, oh, well, as long as I'm thinking rightly about stuff, it doesn't matter what I expose to my sight or my, my other senses. But it does, because the truth that is expressed in the images that we see is going to fill our souls as we continue to view it. So this is an icon, of course, of the creation of Adam by our Lord Jesus Christ in the beginning. Now, if you walk into the American Museum of Natural History in New York, New York, you'll see a very different icon, which is labeled human evolution. And I want you to mentally contrast it with the icon that you just saw. Instead of being light, it's completely dark. Instead of being living, it's dead. And unless you were um, a paleontologist, you might not know this, but instead of being um, a male, it's both female skeletons. It's a female gorilla giving something to a female human. So at every level, this is an inversion of the creation icon that you just saw. And that's not unintentional. 
This is an alternate narrative of how we got here. And it's teaching you something about yourself and about your place in the world. And this is one of the reasons this is so intimately connected to the pro-life movement. And I've given a talk, which I think is also recorded on census fidelium directly on sort of um, meditations, as, particularly as a high school teacher, seeing what believing these icons does to children and just the way they think about themselves and then the way they think about their dignity as human beings. And I'm going to touch a little bit on that as I talk, but keep that kind of in the background of your mind as we go through these things. If you're being presented this image, what would you think about yourself? versus being presented the, the truth about God creating you directly and being the apple of God's eye in the way that, that you saw in the first icon. Okay, so we're going to go through about nine icons today. Um, we're going to look at missing links because, of course, if evolution is true and it happened gradually over time, then you would expect to see lots of transitional forms as we go from the goo through the zoo to you. We're going to look a little bit at the fossil record. I don't know Mr. Owen covered some of that in his last talk, so I'll touch on a few things he didn't. Um, and in terms of using the fossil record to debunk um, gradual evolution, it's sort of like swatting a fly with a Buick, so I always feel a little bit bad for the evolutionists when I talk about that. We'll talk also specifically about dinosaurs um, and some of the evidence related to dinosaurs and the age of the Earth. Um, we'll touch on some radiometric dating issues. And that'll be my first presentation. And then the last presentation of the day, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the tree of death and the phylogeny, um, the relationships that are supposed to exist between living organisms um, based on the concept of homologies. I'll talk about natural selection and mutations as a mechanism to evolution. And uh, that'll be my, my middle talk um, where I'll, I'll kind of go through the, the very very detailed genetics of it, but I did spend some time as a high school teacher, so I'm, I'm what I'm talking about. And then at the very end of the day, we'll talk about um, the the idea that monkeys um, might be related to man, which is not nearly as tenable as we're led to believe it is. So those, that's kind of where we're going today. So we'll start with the missing links. Um, and I'm going to give the most benefit of the doubt that I possibly can to the evolutionists and take their very best sequence that has supposedly no missing links. And we're going to look at that one. Because if you, can, if you can defeat the best, then you've probably also defeated the worst. But you'll see other similar links, um, or similar sequences of dinosaur to bird evolution, or horse evolution, or you know, kind of even the monkeys to men evolution. There are often sequences that are presented saying this kind of organism evolved into that kind of organism. So Dr. Ken Miller, who is a very famous theistic evolutionist of the almost completely materialistic sense, used this particular sequence in court cases um, within recent memory to demonstrate that evolution is true and should be taught in schools. So it's a very fair one to take a look at. So this sequence purports to show that a small, very excited tiger uh, became a slightly larger swimming armadillo gradually on through the many steps into the modern whale that we see. So take a note for a moment of the second one down, the, the slightly larger swimming armadillo, because I'm going to give you a pop quiz. You should have known this was coming when I said I was a teacher. All right, so these are artist representations of prehistoric animals. And um, I'd like you to identify which one is more accurately represents the swimming armadillo you saw in the previous picture. So I'll ask you to do what my students do and show me some thumbs. Do you think it's the one on the top or the one on the bottom? I'm, I'm only getting a few thumbs. So this is this good, good gentleman in the back here helping me out. Okay, the one on the top. You've seen my presentations. <laughs> Aaron, you were thinking. Our artist representations of Pachycetus. So both of these images represent the same animal that you saw as the second missing link in the sequence. And I use this um, to illustrate an important point to keep in mind about paleontology, which paleontologists themselves will joke about. They'll say that if you give them, if you gave them an elephant skeleton and they'd never seen an elephant, they would probably construct a Titanic hamster on top of it. Because when you're looking at bones and you're looking at fossil evidence, you don't actually know anything about fur and you don't actually know anything about fat. And so constructing what an organism looked like is open a little bit to interpretation. So whenever you see images that purport to show uh, sequences of missing links, keep in mind that there's been some artistic license going on there, especially when we get to human evolution, so it'll really come into play. 
So there's multiple different ideas of what our first missing link looks like, in part because the skeleton that, that was recovered was so incomplete. So at the top of the screen, you'll see the actual skeleton that was recovered of Apacacetus, and at the bottom, you'll see what you often see in a museum. You'll see a reconstructed skeleton that sort of gives you the idea that we have a lot more fossil evidence than we really do. And one of the many steps along my journey from evolution to creation was walking into a museum exhibit of human evolution. And in this exhibit, they were at least honest enough to color code the, the skulls so that you saw what part of the skull was actually dug up and what part of the skull was, was creatively reconstructed. And I was looking at most of these skulls and they were very, very small fragments somewhere on the top of the head and they're reconstructing a face. And I said, okay, this is not legitimate. Um, so this is another thing to sort of keep in mind when you're looking at missing links. We're often going off of very fragmentary, very incomplete fossil evidence. And I'll, I'll look at a few more specific examples of that again when we get to human evolution. So our, our third missing link down the line is called Rhodocetus. Um, this is an artist rendering of Rhodocetus, and I want you to, to take a careful note of um, the feet and the tail. And then I want you to look at the actual fossil evidence that we have of this organism. Do you see feet? or a tail, and you don't. So this organism is being reconstructed based on um, half of a skull, about half of a pelvis, a little bit of a leg bone, and some vertebrae. And again, there are many things that we can tell from bones, but we can't tell whether this organism had webbed feet. And originally it was actually drawn with a fluked tail, but it's hard to find those representations now because you know how Google scrubs things. Um, so, there's a little bit of leeway, again, being taken with the actual fossil evidence. Now, Rhodocetus presents us with another huge problem when we look at the sequence that's supposed to have no missing links, because there's supposed to be no transitional forms between Rhodocetus and Bacillosaurus. And if you just look at the size of that, I'm really not sure how the mama on top gave birth to the baby on the bottom. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit of a problem that's, that's super easy to see, but something that, that might not jump out at you is the fact that Rhodocetus has its nostrils in, on the front of its nose, whereas Bacillosaurus has a blowhole in the top of its head. And because it has a blowhole in the top of its head, its nasal passage actually has to be completely disconnected from its mouth. Um, otherwise it would drown when it, it tried to eat something underwater. And also, of course, it has no back legs. It has some little flippers instead. And its tail has gone from a small you know, over a third of its body. I mean, these are massive evolutionary changes, but the sequence is supposed to have no missing links. But you wouldn't have noticed that if you just looked at the original sequence. It shows everything as though we're, we're gradually sizing up and we're gradually getting some external features that, that look kind of important, but the internal features are just as important. And that's a whole lot of changes. It's a whole lot of physiological changes that would have had to happen you know, all at the same time if the sequence is correct. So the evolutionists themselves have admitted this. They've adjusted the whale evolution icon. They've now added the hippo as a, as a closely related relative to the whale. Um, but they replaced uh, Bacillosaurus with Duradon, which helps with the size problem a little bit, but you've still got the blowhole problem and the tail problem and the back leg problem. So we've still got massive evolutionary change in one step. And again, if you just looked at this, um, on a website, you know, on evolution.berkeley.edu, you might be very confused about what it represents and that it somehow represents a complete um, evolutionary sequence. But all it really represents is the fact that the people looking at the fossils can line things up according to size and characteristics and that they have some preconceived notions about what that means. So this image doesn't prove dog evolution because a chihuahua didn't become a Burmese mountain dog. <laughs> You know, they all actually came from uh, original dogs that were a lot more like mutts, and we very carefully and artificially pushed them kind of to genetic extremes. So is this image representing a sequence, or is it representing variability in living organisms? And these are organisms that are now extinct. It depends on what framework you're coming to, to the data with. So. There's been um, some additional problems with some missing links in the past. Uh, the, the coelacanth was thought for a long time to be a missing link between fish and land animals. So the thought is that you go from a single-celled organism to a multicellular invertebrate to a fish to a bird to a mammal. 
and there's myriad problems with that, but there have been many fossils that are put forward as the transition from that fish to fish to the land-dwelling animals. This one was thought to be great because if you look at the, the um, appendages, they look kind of sort of in between a leg and a fin. And so if you just looked at this fossil, you might say, hey, this is, this is kind of on its way to maybe being clumsily able to navigate in shallow waters or out of the water. But then about 100 years later, they, they fished a live one up off the coast of South Africa. And I actually, I know a guy who knows a guy. Um, it actually happened in his village. Uh, not within his memory, within his mother's memory. But so you're not very many people removed from the actual, the actual fishing up of this right now. So when they were discovered off the coast of South Africa in 1938, it was very clear that these animals were fish. They were just fish. They were not on their way to evolving into anything else. So that scrapped that missing link, um, which it tends to be a problem actually with a lot of missing links that are proposed in human evolution and for the for this uh, transition currently. Um, there's there's some uh, one that's popular, and I'm sure that at some point we'll have some reasons to doubt that specifically as well. But just kind of walking you through the history of it, we'll also touch on Archaeopteryx, which is thought to be half bird and half dinosaur. And in the back of um, John Wynn's book, A Catholic Assessment to Evolution Theory, of Evolution Theory, he discusses very, very clearly all of the evidence presented um, regarding this particular fossil. And one of the leading ornithologists in the world has come out and said over and over again, it's a bird, it's a bird, it's a bird. Its feathers are completely modern. It doesn't have the normal breastbone that a bird would have, but it has other places where the muscles, flight muscles could attach. It could definitely fly. Um, and yes, it has claws and teeth, but we see that actually in some other modern birds. And it's remarkably modern to be some sort of transition between birds and dinosaurs. And if you look at the timeline of purported ancestors that have been dug up for birds and dinosaurs, you've got a fossil called Proto-Avis um, that was it discovered, it's supposed to have lived 225 million years ago, which was a, a more modern bird than Archaeopteryx. Now there's a little bit of debate about Proto-Avis because it's um, made of some fossils that were, that were found in a pile together. And this is a problem when the fossil contradicts evolution. But when we get to Java Man and we talk about the fossils that were found like 45 meters apart and then were brought together to make one species, one individual, it, that doesn't matter if you're, if you're putting together something that supports evolution theory. So I will, I will footnote that that one's a little bit debated. But then about 150 million years ago, supposedly, you have Archaeopteryx, which as we've discussed is a bird. It's got some very advanced bird characteristics, actually. And then about 140 to 120 supposed million years ago, you have all the feathered dinosaurs that they started digging up in China, which um, the Creation Ministries International has a really good discussion of are these feathers or are these not feathers. They appear to actually be some sort of integumentary structure that, that, um, that frayed as the animal uh, was fossilized rather than being anything remotely like feathers because feathers are a very complicated, complex structure that these don't really imitate. Um, and then 115 million years ago, supposedly, you've got another bird. And then 80 to 70 million years ago, you've got Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptors. So even if we grant the evolutionists their dates, which I don't, and even if we grant them that the fossil record is a correct sequencing of animals that are ordered, which I don't, but if we granted them their premises, it appears that birds evolved into dinosaurs, not dinosaurs into birds. So that upsets their, their, uh, their ordering there, but at least we know that half of this timeline is true. <laughs> it's my, my preferred half. So. <clears throat> okay, so since we've been talking so much about fossils and missing links, Let's talk about the fossil record. Now, I saw images like the one you see over there to the side showing all the different um, layers of dirt that are laid down and all the different ages that they represent. I saw images like that in textbooks growing up. And I assumed that if I were to drill straight down through the floor wherever I was sitting, I would hit all of those layers. Because, of course, if all these layers are being laid down all over the world over millions of years, you'd have a complete fossil record anywhere in the world you went, right? And, and as you dug down, you'd get older and older and older looking things, and you'd never have this problem that we just talked about where you have birds underneath dinosaurs. 
But I learned when I got older that there's only about 5% or less of the world where you can dig down and get a complete fossil record with all the layers. Now this presents a little bit of a problem for evolution theory, especially when you look at, and I know Mr. Owen discussed this last night, the places where there are millions of years missing in the fossil record. And this one in particular is very interesting because in the, in the, um, the red wall Muav contact between those two layers that are 155 million years apart, according to uh, the time scale that's supposed to be in the fossil record, do you see how straight and flat that connection is? Now, if I were to try to explain those missing years by erosion, do you think I would have a straight flat connection that extended for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square miles? Of course I wouldn't. So there's no real explanation for how I just sort of gently lifted an entire layer, perfectly flat, pancake flat, off of another layer and then, and then laid down more sediment. So there's not really a way for evolutionary biologists using the fossil record as they use it to explain why you have missing ages. There's also not really a way for them to explain why sometimes you have upside down ages. So this is um, kind of dipping into to radiometric dating a little bit. They've, they've used those methods to date um, some layers. This is also in the Grand Canyon. Um, so the Bass layer there dates to 1.06 billion years ago, supposedly. And then there are three very large layers uh, above that. And then you have a layer that dates to 1.11 billion years ago, which is actually older than the uh, sedimentary layer that looks like it's billions of years beneath it. So I've got a little bit of a problem that these things are dating actually almost to the same age if you, if you um, look at statistical significance, but the one is actually dating, the, the, top, the higher one is dating older than the lower one. So if I laid them down starting at the bottom, going up to the top, I wouldn't see results like that. Um, the biggest problem, though, for the fossil record is probably the Cambrian explosion. So if you think back to that original uh, image, the, one of the lowest layers that we have is the Cambrian, and it's the lowest layer in which we find life. And if evolution theory was correct, we would find very simple forms of life down there, and we'd find slightly more complex forms of life above that, and slightly more above that, and slightly more above that, right? And I'm going to use the word phylum, which might bring back horror stories of, of uh, tests in high school biology, but basically a, a domain is kind of the largest, broadest category of organisms you can have, and then you have a kingdom, and the kingdoms are different insofar as plants are in one kingdom, animals are in another kingdom, okay, that's the level of differences you have there. And then you have phyla, right, and so your vertebrates are all in one phyla, and then you have a number of different phyla than vertebrates because they're, they're a lot more um, diverse than vertebrates. And so that's the kind of difference we're talking about. We're talking about the difference between a vertebrate and an invertebrate. That's that level of difference. So there are currently in existence uh, living organisms about 30 different phyla. So 30 different great big categories of living organisms. During the Cambrian explosion, which is that very first layer, they have identified 100, as many as 100 different phyla. So we went from nothing to everything more than we have now, way more than we have now. So the body plans that you see in ancient living organisms are not, um, not always in existence today. And even evolutionists themselves have admitted that the fossil record can basically be of no help with respect to understanding the origin and diversity of the various animal phyla. So we go from nothing to, to all the phyla that we see plus 70 more there's no real way to explain how that came about and why that, why that is that way. Um, so basically, if you were to look at a sort of tree of life, because I'm a visual person, so I don't like to just give you words, I like to give you, give you pictures, um, all of the stuff in the yellow doesn't exist. So we didn't start with a single common ancestor and then go to, to slightly more developed things and slightly more developed things. We started with all the different phyla that you see along the top. And that looks a lot more like the creationist um, forest than, than Darwin's tree of life. So there's actually no evidence for that yellow. And we'll, we'll go back to that a little bit again when we talk about phylogeny here in the next talk. So the fossil record really doesn't help evolution. We can't really find missing links. But surely, surely we know that the Earth is old because dinosaurs lived a really, really long time ago, right? Well, 
that's another interesting example of iconography because whenever you see a picture of dinosaurs, you see something like this. So you see something where there are only dinosaurs. Um, and uh, there wouldn't be that many great big dinosaurs in the same place at the same time, very likely. If you've looked at big animal migration in Africa, you don't have <laughs> all of that intensity at one place. So we have a very, very um, unrealistic picture of how dinosaurs lived on the Earth. So to look at how they might have lived, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Carl Werner. He wrote this book called Living Fossils. And it is the culmination of 20 years of research. He traveled all over the world, asking museum curators all over the world, hey, um, do you have any modern organisms that are buried in the same strata as dinosaurs? Because what he was trying to demonstrate was that dinosaurs don't exist in this prehistoric world that's completely unidentifiable from what we exist in. They existed in a world very much like ours, not that long ago, because he himself is also a young Earth creationist. So of course, if you ask a museum curator, are there modern fossils buried with dinosaurs? They say, no, of course not. Well, then he started asking, well, do you have any fish that are buried in the same layer as dinosaurs? And they said, oh yeah, we have all kinds of fish that are buried in the same layer as dinosaurs. Well, do you, do you have any reptiles that are buried in the same layer as dinosaurs? Oh yeah, yeah, we have, we have reptiles that are buried in the same layer as dinosaurs. By the way, um, I just want to make a point about uh, nomenclature, taxonomic nomenclature. Um, these skeletons, it's hard to tell from the pictures that I, I uh, robbed off of Wikimedia Commons because of fossils, um, but I didn't want to violate copyright. So he, these, these bones are pretty much indistinguishable, the ancient bones are pretty much indistinguishable from the modern bones, yet the organism is not only assigned a different species name, it's assigned a different genus name because it's ancient. So therefore it can't be the same. And if you look, if you go back to the previous one, it's the same thing, we've got a different genus name, completely different scientific classification, even though these organisms look basically identical. You know, if I, if I had to tell the difference, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And of course, we can't tell if they're actually separate species because by the biological definition, because fossils can't reproduce. So the biological definition of species is that a group of organisms that can only interbreed with each other. Um, so there's some assumptions being made here about these organisms. And then of course he asked the million dollar question, do you have any mammals that are buried in the same layers as dinosaurs? Oh yeah, this is a possum. That was uh, in, in Jurassic layers along with dinosaurs. Um, and not only that, the, uh, the curator of vertebrate paleontology at the College of Eastern Utah's prehistoric museum um, had this enlightening thing to say. We find mammals in almost all of our sites. These were not noticed before because they were very small. We have about 20,000 pounds of bentonite clay that has mammal fossils that we are trying to give away to some researcher. It's not that they're not important, it's just that you only live once and I specialized in something other than mammals. I specialized in reptiles and dinosaurs. So he's literally sitting on evidence of mammal and dinosaur coexistence. Do you know why? Because he loses grant funding. Okay, this, this would be, you know, you're sitting out there saying, this would be a huge scientific advance, this would be amazing. And he's sitting there going, if I, if I do anything that upsets the evolutionary paradigm, I'm gonna lose tenure and I'm gonna lose my grant money. And he's not wrong. So is there any more evidence that, you know, of a recent existence of dinosaurs? Well, why, why yes, there is. In fact, there's a whole book called Echoes of the Jurassic by Dr. Kevin Anderson that I highly recommend. Um, he, he looks at the biological evidence. And there's another book called Dragons and Dinosaurs by Derek Isaacs. He gets a little bit anti-Catholic towards the end of the book, so I would, I would take that chapter with a grain of salt. But he presents all the archeological evidence for uh, recent existence of dinosaurs. But I find the biological evidence more, um, I wouldn't say more compelling, but um, more palatable sometimes to a very science-believing public. <laughs> so in 2003, um, Dr. Mary Schweitzer found soft tissue in dinosaur bones. And you can actually go on YouTube and you can look up 60 Minutes 
Mary Schweitzer, or you can look up 60 Minutes T-Rex, and you will find the very secular interview done by 60 Minutes in 2003 about this massively important find. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. <gasps> no. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur yeah. bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you see this and you think, what? You say, I didn't you want say, to tell anybody. <laughs> you'd be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, OK, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after sample, they were there. Things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. I mean, How could that be? How could that be? That's right. The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that. Blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science that organic material can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Mary, Jack, and their team published their B-Rex findings in a series of papers in the journal Science and were promptly attacked. So she, um, basically what happened was she took dinosaur bone and they wanted to sort of, sort of dissolve away the outer layer of the bone to look at the, the inner structure of the bone and someone, probably a overtired graduate student, left the bones in the acid a little bit too long and dissolved everything away. And your average researcher would say, well, we know, we know, there's nothing there, throw those out and start again. Thanks be to God, Dr. Schweitzer didn't do that. She said, well, let's take a look. And she found intact blood vessels, and she found, um, these are actually pictures of what she found, not just random pictures from, from uh, Wikimedia Commons. So she found pictures of intact blood vessels. That one's got a red blood cell in it, to that side. And the other side, those cells that have the, um, those really branchy structures, if you're, if you're not used to looking at cells under a microscope, you might think that these are very dried out cells, that this is kind of an artifact of them being, being dry and, um, and dead. But actually, these are osteocytes. They're cells that are involved in building your bone and they have that feathery structure naturally so that that very delicate feathery structure has been preserved in these bones that are supposedly 67 million years old. Now I don't think I have to explain to you the laws of biology and chemistry that would dictate that that can't possibly survive 67 million years um, but you can look up the papers on that if you're, if you're really terribly interested. Um, so the scientists found themselves in a conundrum. They're having to explain how the soft tissue could survive 67 million years. So they came up with a couple of different theories. Um, the first hypothesis was basically that, uh, and this is the standard hypothesis that's thrown out usually whenever you get results that support a young earth, there was contamination. Absolutely, there was totally, this is, this is a bacterial biofilm. Now, if you've ever um, seen a pond that's kind of grown over the top with, with that little sludgy scum. That's a biofilm. That's what a biofilm looks like. Um, there's also probably a biofilm on your teeth right now, not to gross you off, but um, that's not a biofilm. Biofilms don't look anything like those things. Okay, especially not when you look at them under the microscope. So, but Dr. Mary Schweitzer said, all right, well, if it's bacteria, it won't have the protein collagen in it because collagen is only found in vertebrates. So if this really came from a vertebrate, it will have collagen in it. I will get an antibody for collagen, and I will test it for collagen, and guess what? It had collagen, so the protein was definitely from a vertebrate, definitely not a biofilm. So they tried another, another rejection. Well, um, the tissue must have been absolutely, completely, like hermetically sealed from oxygen and microbes, and maybe that's how it survived 67 million years. Well, that was a bad hypothesis because at least one of the samples 
and that they uncovered it at um, Hell Creek, Montana, which is where they found them. And this is the one that contained the, the, the super feathery, like, delicate cells, was um, wet from infiltrating rainwater when they dug it out. So definitely not completely sheltered from oxygen and microbes. So try again. So the third hypothesis, and this one actually was developed by Dr. Schweitzer herself, was that um, when, the, when the organism died, the blood cells broke open and the iron somehow protected the soft tissue from degradation for millions of years. So she did an experiment and she looked at um, uh, tissue decay on her lab bench at, at room temperature um, in, in a petri dish using tissue that was soaked in iron and tissue that was not. And she said, oh well, and she carried it out for two years. And she said, well, the iron definitely makes a difference over two years, and it did. Um, but it made a qualitative difference, not a quantitative difference. So they weren't. She wasn't going in and stretching the tissue and seeing how much it could break. She was just sort of looking at it and saying, "Well, this looks much more degraded than this one." And it turns out that you could replicate those same results using water with red dye in it. Um, so that doesn't seem to be a very good scientific result. And also, she only did it for two years, and she extrapolated it to 67 million. And to just kind of put that in context for you, if I had two dollars and I asked the bank to extrapolate it to 67 million, mm, they probably wouldn't. Um, also, even if she was correct, which I don't think she is, there are many other instances where there are very well-preserved tissues that had no exposure to blood at all, so they would have had no exposure to, to iron. So she can't explain how those tissues, ancient tissues, come to be. So the scientists are faced with this terrible conundrum. You know, the, the laws of science tell them the soft tissue can only survive maybe thousands, not millions of years. Um, and then they have T-Rex fossils with soft tissue, so there's two. You can, you can either conclude that the T-Rex lived thousands, not millions of years ago, or you can conclude that the laws of science as you know them and have studied them in the lab are wrong. And unfortunately, most people are so stuck on evolutionary theory as a paradigm that they choose B rather than A, in case you weren't convinced there's also the archaeological evidence. Now when I show this in a classroom, before I show this slide, I usually will ask students to take out a piece of paper and draw a pink fairy armadillo. And they try very hard. Um, and of course none of them actually comes up with the, the cute little, you know, yay long animal that's back curves slightly this way and his nose is a little bit pug and he's got fuzzy, fuzzy fur. And yes, he is in fact pink. Um, and you can look him up also on Google. But I, I do this in order to demonstrate to them a very important point, that you can't draw an animal that you've never seen. And yet, we have a perfectly proportional stegosaurus that was carved into the wall of a temple in Cambodia that dates somewhere between the 9th and 12th centuries AD. This was long before dinosaur bones were dug up, and long after dinosaurs were supposed to have been dead. How did this get here? Well, again, I recommend to you the book Dragons and Dinosaurs by Derek Isaacs because he goes through loads of archaeological evidence. This just happens to be my favorite. I like some of sources. They're cool looking. Right? <clears throat> They're also very difficult to just imagine into existence. Okay. So since we're talking about uh, dinosaurs, we should probably talk about radiometric dating, carbon dating. And again, I'm going to give the evolutionists the, the most benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to look specifically at carbon dating, because carbon dating is the most reliable, because it goes over the shortest age, and we can actually calibrate it using um, fossils, of, or, or not fossils, but artifacts of known age. So it should be the, the best they've got, and if it's not very good, we can presume that the rest of it is, is even worse. Um, so to talk a little bit about radiometric dating, I want to give you a basic, basic chemistry lesson on uh, radioactive carbon. So there's carbon-14 in the atmosphere, um, and it's, it's uh, created by uh, radiation that's hitting the atmosphere, and that's a lot more complicated than I care to go into at this moment. But basically, it's there, and it can react with oxygen to become radioactive carbon dioxide. Now, plants love carbon dioxide because that's how they make their sugars. So the plants will take in the radioactive carbon dioxide and they will make radioactive glucose. And then, of course, an animal will eat the plants and then the animal will make radioactive muscle tissue and you know other kinds of tissue. So then when you eat a hamburger, you get some radioactive glucose or a salad, either way. 
you're still getting radioactive glucose. So as long as an, an organism is alive, you're actually consuming a very small amount of radioactive carbon. It's a very small amount. So carbon's going in and carbon's going out while you're alive because of course you're also um, excreting waste. But when you die, there's no more carbon-14 going into the organism. It's only going out, and it's only going out through radioactive decay. So spontaneously, over time, carbon-14 converts to nitrogen-14, and it's no longer present in the organism. So, we know how much carbon-14 was in the bone to begin with, and we know how much carbon-14 there is now, we should theoretically be able to calculate how long the bone has been dead. Does that make sense? Okay. Someone said yes, so I'm going to assume that's yes for everyone. <laughs> okay. All right. So theoretically, based on um, actual molecules present, you could calculate the age of something that's up to 100,000 years old. But as you might know if you've worked with anything that made by humans, there's always a margin of error. You can't actually detect a single molecule of carbon-14. So realistically, uh, carbon dating labs will tell you somewhere around 42, 43,000 years is the oldest thing they can date. So there's a little bit of margin of error there. So Mr. Owen and I know a gentleman who is now deceased. If you could say a prayer for him, I'm sure he'd appreciate it. His name's Hugh Miller. He took 11 samples of dinosaur bone and he sent them to carbon-14 labs. And the dates that he got on all these bones were between 23 and 38,000 years, which is well within that 42 to 43,000 year cutoff. And it's about 1,700 times younger than the supposed extinction date of 65 million years ago. And we'll get in a minute to why it's older than 6 to 10,000 years because there's, there's a, actually a physiological reason for that too. But this is well within the detection limit established by leading radiocarbon dating labs. And it presents a problem for thinking that these bones are 67 million years old. It presents a real, again, just like the soft tissue, a real hard, fast scientific problem. So instead of dealing with that problem, the um, director of the Center for Applied Isotope Studies wrote this letter to Mr. Miller. Dear Mr. Miller, I have recently become aware of the work that you and your team have been conducting with respect to radiocarbon dating of bone. The scientists at CAIS and I are dismayed by the claims that you and your team have made with respect to the age of the Earth and the validity of biological evolution. Consequently, we are no longer able to provide radiocarbon services in support of your anti-scientific agenda. I have instructed the radiocarbon laboratory to return your recent samples to you and to not accept any future samples for analysis. Follow the science, guys. So, was Mr. Miller the only person to find carbon-14 where it shouldn't be? No. There's actually at least 90 different peer-reviewed journal articles that note carbon-14 being present in ancient artifacts when it shouldn't be. They should be too old. They should be past that 43 to 40, 42 to 43,000 year old mark. Um, and so uh, Reuben Sanford, who wrote the book Contested Bones, which is a very good book on um, supposed human uh, ancestors, uh, had this to say. It's remarkable, but essentially everything in the fossil record contains measurable levels of carbon-14. This seems contrary to popular wisdom, but is widely recognized within the carbon-14 community. Taken at face value, this suggests that the entire fossil record is less than 100,000 years old. I would say less than 42,000 years old, but you know, distinctions. Um, many will be offended with, by this idea, but like it or not, this is what the carbon-14 dating appears to be showing. So something is not quite right here. Um, but we also have problems that carbon-14 isn't present when it should be. So um, a moment ago I said we talk about why things could date to a little bit older than they actually are. Well, um, we've gotten a number of dates, and again these are in peer-reviewed sources, where, um, for example, a living tree dates to 10,000 years before the present. So that tree's been dead for 10,000 years, even though they just took a piece of wood out of it right now, because it's taking carbon in uh, near an airport. So it's absorbing uh, gases that are very old and very deficient in carbon-14. There is uh, plants that are growing in well water that's depleted of radioactive carbon that date to even older than that. There's um, you know a number of examples of this. So so you can have um, you can have a lack of carbon-14 when it should be there, and carbon-14 present when it shouldn't be there. 
um, according to to what we are, are assuming, at least for the shouldn't be present. Um, so why is that? Well, there's three key assumptions from radiometric dating, and the, the first one applies mainly to the um, to the uh, the way it's worded applies mainly to the heavy metal dating, and I'll I'll, I'll modify it for carbon fourteen. So in carbon fourteen, the first assumption is that we know how much carbon-14 was in the atmosphere at the time that the organism died. Okay, so we're assuming that we know how much carbon-14 was in the atmosphere at the time the organism died, because if there was less than there is now, that organism is going to date to older than it actually is. Because, remember, we're measuring how much carbon-14 is left, so if they started out here instead of up here, and we're measuring, comparing them to up here, they're going to date to twice as old as they are. Okay. Um, for heavier metal dating, the assumption is that there's no daughter element in the rock at the time it was formed. So if uranium decays to lead, we're assuming that all of the lead present in the rock is a result of radioactive decay. And none of the lead was there just because lead is there. Um, so both of these assumptions are invalid for a number of reasons. So we'll deal specifically with the carbon-14. The level of radioactive carbon-14 in the atmosphere is not currently at equilibrium. And what equilibrium means is that it's changing but stays the same. This is sort of like my bank account. There is things going in and things going out, but I'm always roughly around zero. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's equilibrium. So if there's, if, if the carbon-14 in the atmosphere is fluctuating, if it's going up, it's going down, and depending on when we measure it, we know it's not at equilibrium. If we know it's not at equilibrium, we know that our assumption that it was the same 6,000 years ago as it is now is probably invalid. Okay, the second assumption that radiometric dating requires is that whatever you're dealing with, whether it's a rock or a bone, is a closed system, meaning that no parent or daughter element has been introduced or removed. So you can't have soaked everything in water. But we know that everything at one point was soaked in water and that a lot of things are soluble in water and so that can cause changes in bones, it can cause changes in carbon-14 composition in, or, or, sorry, mineral composition in rocks, carbon-14 composition in bones. So that assumption is invalid. And the third assumption that is necessary for radiometric dating is that the rate of decay has been constant for the rock's entire history. Now, both the people who want to say the rate of decay has been constant and I have determined that the rate of decay has fluctuated in this way are doing what's called historical science. And historical science is not actually really the same thing as empirical science. It's not, it's not you can't have certainty in the same sort of way. But you can, if you, if you, and again, this is a slightly more complicated chemistry lesson, but if you think about radioactive decay, you have something called a half-life. So carbon-14's half-life is roughly 5,000 years, so at the end of 5,000 years, I'll have half the carbon. And at the end of five more thousand years, I always ask my students this, and they'll say, you have no carbon. No, you have a quarter of the carbon you had when you started, and they go, what? Um, because half of it decays, because the decay rate is dependent on the amount of uh, uh, radioactive matter present. So we actually know that the decay is not constant over time. So all three of these assumptions are invalid, and radiometric dating is sitting on very shaky footing when you, you are dating anything that isn't, that you don't have a known date for that you can calibrate. Um, and this comes up again and again when, when rocks are dated with, with the, the um, like uranium lead or argon uh, dating methods. So um, John Morris notes in his book on geology that when the same rock is dated by more than one method, it will often yield different ages. And when the rock is dated more than one time, even by the same method, it often gives different results. So you end up with this scattering of radiometric results depending on what I, I I'm not icon, what ion you're using, where, which part of the rock you date, and I don't know whether it's a, it's a full moon in Singapore or something, um, because it, it doesn't even give the same result with the same method um, from the same rock. So this leads to an unfortunate methodology problem with a lot of these radio dating labs, and these are screenshots that I've taken from um, just a, a sampling of radiocarbon dating lab, laboratories, one in Australia and then um, one in Russia and one here. 
and all of them, when, they, when uh, someone is submitting something to be dated, ask them to give either the stratigraphic location, that's where it is in the fossil record, where it is in the, um, where you dug it up, what layer you dug it up in, is it a Cambrian rock, is it a Jurassic rock, is it a, uh, you know, pre-Cambrian rock. And some of them even ask you to estimate how old you think the rock is. So then when they get their smattering of results, they can pick the one that's closest to the other data that you're giving them. So it becomes an actual uh, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. I think the rock is this old. I found the rock in this layer, and the dates I'm getting back from the radiocarbon laboratory correspond with that, but they correspond with that because the radiocarbon laboratory made me tell them it was a Jurassic rock. Um, so you get serious, serious selection bias. Um, so that is the conclusion for my first talk. We'll resume with the Tree of Life later. And um, I think, am I early? I don't know if that's ever happened in the history of the Colby Center. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I could take I could take a few. Do I have until noon? Okay, I could take a few questions until noon. And I, um, my voice is is uh, going, which is part of the reason I'm speaking so softly and quietly and gently into the microphone. So I will not be here for the final question and answer session later this afternoon. I'm pretty sure I'll have no voice by then. So if you have a question, please try to ask it now. Um, Okay, you can make a line at the microphone if you like. And because I am a school teacher, I will make for you to say that your question must end in a question mark. Okay. So I appreciate this presentation very much, but how did they get it so wrong? Like it's one thing to say, oh, it's maybe between 50,000 and 100,000, but to jump to 65 million years, how did they get it that wrong? What possible basis did they have for that? Can you explain that, please? Sure. Um, so it actually goes back to to Lyell um, and his his uniformitarianism and his long ages and. Honestly, um, it, you know, usually when people ask me why questions, I present on some other very controversial topics, which I won't uh, mention at the microphone because I'm being recorded. Um, but why questions are very difficult to answer because I can't um, attest to the, the state of the individuals making the decisions, but I can make kind of a generalization. So when Lyell um, argued that everything is laid down very slowly and everything is constant over time, if that was true, then you have to have long ages. And also, if you have long ages, and that is true, you don't have to believe in the beginning of uh, scripture. And if you don't have to believe in the beginning of scripture, there's a lot of other things you don't have to believe too. And so this, this stuff became kind of ideologically fixed, um, not necessarily because of uh, a strictly scientific interpretation because Lyell himself was not a geologist. Um, he didn't really know anything about rock. He didn't do any laboratory studies. He just wandered around the countryside looking at things and then he came up with a theory, which is sort of what Darwin did. And that was how you did science back then. Um, because it was very enlightenment based and it's very much like, you know, what is up here is, is right and I don't necessarily need to, you know, get in and get grubby. Um, so once that became the found an intellectual foundation that, that became acceptable, then, then you had, um, you know, the Enlightenment also was, a, it was an era of um, moral licentiousness. And if I can intellectually justify my loose morals, then I'm going to be very attached to that explanation. And then if I build on that explanation and every, everything that comes in after that, I hook to it. And you can't, you can't read a biological paper now without them making some reference to how this evolved or how that evolved or phylogeny. And you think it'd, it'd be in an area that's completely different. But they've got to throw some little bit of evolution in there because the more that you say it and the more that you put it together, the harder it is for someone to question it. And you know, I've been in multiple different biology departments at this point, and to, to even ask the question, like, how would you explain the carbon dating of these dinosaur bones, that you can't ask the question. So you've got, you've got the problem of for, for moral deviation at a time when that was, that was already kind of in place. People hung on to it really, really easily, really quickly. And then now you have the problem of 
you know, I, I've, I've grown up with this my whole life, I can't think any other way, and if I think that other way, people are going to call me stupid, they're going to, you know, they're going to, I'm going to lose funding, you know, this and that. So, the science, it, as you may have noticed in the last three years, has it revealed itself to be a, a kind of, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but like, you know, one of those, one of those clubs where the members select who can come in, and so a certain class of people gets excluded naturally. Um, scientific journals actually work that same way. There are even peer-reviewed articles that you can read on how bad peer review is because of the, the sort of cronyism, that's what I'm looking for, that, that, that happens. So, so it was a long time in developing that way, but those are kind of some of the factors that are, that are playing in there. I won't say that's a comprehensive answer, but off the top of my head. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. So I homeschool and I have five children. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, <laughs> you, um, as you were saying, everything is contaminated. You can't buy any book that well very much mm -hmm. that has not a tint of like the light from saying of evolution, right? So I'm trying, and because we have been so contaminated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you, how do you teach like, this? Where do you stop? Yeah. How do you, obviously right now my, my oldest is eight years old, so I don't, I have time to think about what I'm gonna be presenting, such as like the biology book mm -hmm. from here, and we try to just stay with mm -hmm. creation, creation, creation. Yeah, so a large part of the problem actually is not even just uh, creation versus evolution when you go to teach science, it's that we have lost an understanding of appropriate scientific methodology and that goes all the way back to the very foundations of um, basically the way every book is structured. They'll start with something small that you can't see, so in chemistry you learn about atoms instead of learning about something that you actually can see and can understand it and then kind of kind of um, break it down and work it apart. That's how you build knowledge. You start with what you know. Um, so every modern science textbook kind of presents it backwards. Um, so you have that sort of epistemological problem that's present constantly in all this stuff in addition to the creation evolution problem. 